Good morning, church. So good to be together. I'll be reading this morning from the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 9, verses 11 to 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashers of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This is the word of the Lord. Hopefully everybody said, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I know some of you seated are on your couches or comfortable chair. Uh, Logan showed me some of you that are online. I want to say hi to you and welcome for jo- welcome. Glad you have joined us this morning uh, as we uh, again look at the book of Hebrews together. If you have a Bible or if you have a phone with a Bible app, I want to encourage you to uh, get to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, as we're going to look at that together uh, this morning. You know, I don't know about you, but but um, my week hasn't been the easiest week. I kind of had a hard week. I'm sure some of you did too. But well, one of the things that, um, that always helps my week go better is that two uh, days every week I have uh, two of our granddaughters that, that come and visit us and they spend a night with us and two days. And um, I get bossed around a lot during those days. They're four and one. Now, the one-year-old only likes me when my wife, Chris, isn't there. Uh, When she's there, and if I look at her, she just starts crying, right? But the four-year-old likes me and likes to boss me around and says, Gramps, let's play. And, of course, she's always the boss, and and I'm the, uh, she's the teacher, I'm the student, or whatever it is, you know. But but we also like to go outside and, and do things, and we've had a uh, a pile of sand there for a while, and we would make a sand castle on there, and, and uh, a, a pool with a slide and stuff like that. But one thing that kind of intrigued me uh, that I'm, I was hearing from her a few times on the last couple of months, we'd go outside and we'd start to do something that she had done before. And she would stop, and she would look at me, and she would say, Gramps, that's what I'm called, Gramps. Gramps, is this safe? You know? And I would, have to, I would have to hold back my smile and my chuckle because she was serious, even though I knew that she had done that before. But she stops and she says, Gramps, is it safe? You know, I thought about that with regards to us. We are also people who need reassurance from time to time, don't we? We need reminders, especially when life seems to be confusing and difficult and challenging. We live in confusing times, don't we? We we struggle with what is true, what is right, what, what does the future hold, and how will all of this turn out? And in all of that confusion, we can find ourselves drifting from believing, trusting, and following Jesus and drifting toward fear, anger, and dealing with life the way everyone else does, doing what seems easier, and starting to pledge our ultimate allegiance to something other than or someone other than Jesus. And just like my granddaughter, it's okay for us to stop and ask questions every once in a while when we are unsure and when we are confused. 
And the ultimate question that the writer of this letter, or dissertation, if you want, of Hebrews is addressing is this, is Jesus better? People to whom the writer is writing because of persecution, unrest, and confusion with with what they had been taught in the past, they, they were starting to drift. They needed a reminder and encouragement that Jesus is better. And so the author answers the question for them and for us today, is Jesus really better? By the way, I don't think the people wrote him a letter and said, hey, these are our questions, blah, 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 blah. Hey, is Jesus better? No, he just knew, and we know, don't we? When we're in circumstances of of pain or hurt or confusion or, or whatever it is, that sometimes we just need reminders. And so the writer of Hebrews writes this letter of encouragement to them and to us as well, answering the question, is Jesus better? And his thesis statement, his summary, if you will, is actually found in Hebrews verses 1 through 3, and we need to start there because everything else is hinged on this. It says, long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And then he says this, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Do you get this? Jesus, okay, who is his son, whom he appointed the what? The heir of how many things? Of all things, through whom he also created the what? The world. Look at verse three. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. In other words, he is God and he upholds, this is Jesus, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of high, on high. This is his thesis statement in answering the question, is Jesus better? And then he goes into a little more detail. If you've been with us the last few weeks, we've we've been talking about this. And the first question, the first one was, is that Jesus is better than the angels. And we talked about we need to know if Jesus is who he is in verses 1 through 4, 1 through 3, then he's definitely better than the angels. So we need to pay attention to who he is and what he offers but when, well, when life happens to us and we get busy and things go keep, keep bubbling up on us, our view of Jesus begins to diminish and we forget who he is and we need to ask the question, is Jesus better? And he's saying, duh, Jesus is so much better than the angels. Josh McDowell years ago wrote a book called Evidence Demands a Verdict. When he was talking about Jesus, he says that Jesus never gave us the opportunity to call him just a good moral teacher or or a prophet or, or being on the level with anybody else. You see, he claimed to be God. And so we either have to believe that Jesus was God or that he was a liar or a lunatic. But you see, his life didn't reflect either of those other two. Jesus was man, and Jesus was God. And yes, much better than the angels. How is Jesus better? Is is Jesus also offers us a better rest, as Pastor Logan talked about, a greater rest that nothing on this earth offers. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29, he says, Come to me, all who are what? Weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. 
take my yoke upon you. In other words, do it my way, not your way. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find what? Rest for your souls. Is Jesus the better rest? If he is perfect, if he is God, if he is eternal, if he loves you, if he wants the best for you, duh, he's the better rest. Thirdly, last week, Pastor Logan taught about Jesus being a better priest. In, verse, in chapter 4 of Hebrews, starting with verse 15, talked about the fact that since Jesus had experienced everything on earth that we experience, and yet did it without sin, in word and thought, okay, did it without sin, which, by the way, I thought was great that Pastor Logan pointed out, it's got to be a lot tougher to have all that stuff and not fall to any of it than it is to fall. Jesus did that. And because of that, he can sympathize with all of our weaknesses. And because he is eternal and alive, he is our priest forever. He is always there for you. He is always interceding for you. And you see, all of this is true because of verses 1 through 3. This is who he is, and he loves you, and he wants you with him and the Father for all eternity. His love, power, peace, and presence is there for you every single day. So if this Jesus is greater than anything on earth, in other words, better than the angels, are you paying attention to what he offers? Are you? Because it's far better. Angels? He created them. If this Jesus offers a better rest, rest, and duh, because of who he is, he can and wants to out of love for you, then seek it. Don't mock it. Don't harden your heart against it and say, no, thank you, Jesus. At least for today, I've got this. Or worse of all, no, thank you, Jesus. I don't need you to find rest. If Jesus is the better priest, then depend on him, talk to him, confess to him, hope in him, get to know him, follow his lead, let him guide you into the very presence of your heavenly Father. Quit trying to be your own advocate before God, your own defense attorney. Let Jesus take care of that. He is more than capable. So as Pastor Logan taught us last week, we just need to grow up and trust him and receive his grace for our lives. Is this your Jesus? That's the question, isn't it? Is this your Jesus? If you have trusted in Christ, have you drifted from depending on him? As if all of this from, is not true? Have you li- drifted from, from living as if it is true? In other words, sometimes we can just say, right? Yeah, Jesus is better. But if I'm not living in response to that, then I've drifted from that. Do you need to ask yourself the question, are you living out the truth that Jesus is better? Does your life reflect your confession that Jesus is better. Maybe you're here or watching online and you're on a journey of trying to figure out whether, figure out maybe for the first time if Jesus is really better. If following him, putting your faith in him is worth it. If it's what you really want. I just want to encourage you to see, keep seeking Keep asking questions. Keep learning about Jesus, and you will find that there is nothing close to him. 
He is better than anything else life offers. And by the way, Jesus is okay with your question. Jesus is okay with asking, Jesus, are you better? Just like my granddaughter asking me, Gramps, is it safe? Jesus is okay with us saying, Jesus, are you better? Now, about now, some of you may be wondering if this is going to be the shortest sermon you've ever heard at Skull Cornerstone, because it seems like I'm wrapping up. But no, just getting started. It's just that the truth that Jesus is better is such a big deal when it comes to living life today and eternity. I felt I needed to go back and put it all together and remind us how Jesus is better. So much confusion, pain, anger, and hate, depression, worry, disease, and turmoil in our world today. We need this assurance, this truth, this reality that Jesus is better. So today we continue this journey of remembering, learning, and trusting the truth that Jesus is better. We're not done. There's a lot more reasons to believe that Jesus is better. And the writer of the Hebrews' next point to the people is that Jesus is the better sacrifice. Let's look back at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. It says, but when Christ appeared as the high priest of, of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of the defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more for the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purifying our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see, the Hebrew people were very familiar with sacrifice. Sacrifice for their sins meant that someone, something had to die. God is a holy God and cannot accept sin in his presence. God directed the Hebrew people to set up a series of different animal sacrifices for their regular atonement of their sins before God. And the annual day of atonement emphasized so much the separation between a holy God and a sinful people. You see, only the high priest was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God but he was only allowed to go in once a year and only offering a sacrifice for his own sins and the sins of his family. So a young bull was sacrificed, and he went into the presence of God and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. And then he went out and he sacrificed a goat, and he took that blood in as a sacrifice for the people, and he sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat. You see, on his own, he was not good enough even being the high priest to enter the very presence of God. He needed a sacrifice for himself. And you also see, as we read this passage, that a heifer was also sacrificed and, and actually burned up, so all was left was ashes, and the ashes were used to sprinkle on people who had, who had touched things that were dead, who, who, who were considered unholy. And all of this, all of this, all of this detail, all of this ceremony was to point to the fact that there is a very holy God and that we need a sacrifice in order to be in his presence. You see, all this was done annually, and it cleansed the people ceremonially so that God would stay in their presence, but it was never meant to truly forgive sins, but to look forward to Jesus, a Savior who would die for the sins of the people. So you can say, okay, Steve, yeah, that's okay for the Hebrew people, but how does that relate to me? Well, the Apostle Paul kind of helps us with that. In his book, in his, in his letter that he wrote to the Roman Christians, 
chapter 3, verse 23, he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes every one of us. And then in chapter 6 of that same letter, in verse 23, he states that the wages of that sin is death. You see, Paul, even before he was a Christian, was one of the most meticulous followers of the law of God on the face of the earth. And he's saying, that all includes me. He is the one saying that our sin leads to death. A sacrifice, you see, has to be made for sin for all of it. Think you're good enough? Think you're just going to wait it out and say, I think, I think when it comes down to it, my good will outweigh my, my bad. Look at what Jesus said to the religious leaders of his, of his time who, who would think that way. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm sure he was looking straight at them when he said, you have heard it said uh, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. I can hear them saying, not me. I'm good. And then he says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. Oops. Later on in that same chapter, the, the, Matthew records the words of Jesus when he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. King David in the Old Testament told to have, uh, was, was, a, it was told to be a, God, a man after God's own heart, wrote this. Psalm 139, he says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. God knows everything about you. And you know, if you're willing to admit it, that you need to be saved from your sin. And that salvation only comes through a sacrifice of death. We can talk ourselves into thinking we can be good enough and earn God's favor. We can. But we can never live up to the holy, perfect standards of God. We need, we need a sacrifice. I used to think that I was an okay tennis player. I lived in Chicago. I was, I was going to graduate school, and there was this tennis club near us, and they let us go in there and play, and I thought I was pretty good. And then a pro from the area came in and started hitting golf, hitting golf balls, hitting tennis balls on the court next to me. And I soon realized how far my game was away from being good. I used to think I was a pretty good basketball player. And then I had a class in college with Magic Johnson. Oops, not very good. The Apostle John, the, the, the probably the youngest disciple of Jesus, hung out with Jesus, probably told jokes with Jesus, all kinds of stuff with Jesus. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm good. He tells on himself as he writes in the, in, the, in the letter we have called Revelation. He says, he saw the glorified Jesus and he fell down as though dead. You see, the gap between our lives and that of a holy God cannot be crossed without the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. But listen to the great news that is in this passage. The writer of Hebrews says, but when Christ appeared, 
appeared. But when Christ appeared as high priest. Remember? Remember the one from the beginning of this letter? The one who, who, who created everything? The one who is the radiance of God's glory? Who is God? That is Jesus he is the high priest who can identify with all of our weaknesses. We have a high priest who has been tempted in every way and did not sin in thought or deed. He is the one who, along with being our high priest, is also our sacrifice. It is his own blood that he offers freely to God the Father for our sins, not in a tent, but in heaven, in the very presence of God. He rose from the dead, and, he's, and, he's, and he goes to the Father with his pierced hands and his pierced side, and he said, God, the Father, I have taken care of this. And because he is who he is, the perfect God, man, fully God and fully man, his sacrifice on our behalf is eternal. So if you have accepted Jesus, your Savior, then you have been purchased back from death to life through the sacrifice of Jesus, through the shedding of his own blood. He has taken your place, and his sacrifice covers it all. Paul says in Romans, in his letter to the Romans again, in chapter 8, he says, there is therefore, therefore, on the basis of Jesus' sacrifice, rising from the dead, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who have accepted Christ Jesus, for those who have bowed the knee to Jesus, for those who have proclaimed him Jesus as Lord. There are no, there is no condemnation, none now, none tomorrow, none forever, for sins known, for sins not known, sins of thought and sins that you've done. It is all taken care of. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. Jesus is the better sacrifice. But let's get a little more practical and personal as we finish this up this morning. There are a few ways in which Jesus' sacrifice is better that I just want to leave you with. If you have the sermon notes, they're right there for you. If not, I'll try to be real specific about this so you can follow along with me. So the question I wrote down on my notes is, so why is Jesus' sacrifice better? So here it is. Jesus' sacrifice is better, number one, because it gives us access in to the very presence of God. We don't need anyone else other than Jesus. We have access to him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Hebrews 19 22, I'm sorry, Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. I'm just going to read this because this is what he says in response to all of this. He says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, in other words, we can go anytime, anywhere into the presence of God because of Jesus' sacrifice. By the new and living way, Right? That he, Jesus, opened for us through the curtain. Remember when Jesus died on the cross? The curtain that separated the Holy of Holies where the presence of God was, it split in two, it opened up. That we now have direct access to a holy and awesome God. That is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Why is Jesus' sacrifice better? Because it gives us access to the presence of God. That's number one. Number two, 
Why is Jesus' sacrifice better? Because it is a gift of love for you. It is a gift of love for you. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friend. Jesus laid down his life. I think it's interesting. I was, I've been reading in, in the Gospel of John and my personal devotions, and I came to John 18 where Jesus is uh, about to be arrested. Uh, some soldiers and some people from the, from the temple and, and people who work for the high priests and that and a whole, whole group of them, probably a, like a mob like comes out looking for Jesus. And uh, Jesus knows they're coming, and he so goes out to meet them. And he asks them kind of a silly question. He says, who are you looking for? And, he, and they go, we're looking for Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm he. And what does it say? What does it say that that whole mob, happened to that whole mob? That they fell back and fell down. What does that tell me? They didn't take Jesus. Jesus went. He loves you that much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting light, life. In Romans chapter 5, the apostle Paul also writes this, that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it, nothing. He just chose to. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a what? Gift of God. But no one boast. And here in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, the writer of Hebrews says this for us, to remind us. He says, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste Death for everyone. Jesus' sacrifice is better. Jesus' sacrifice is better because it gives us access to the presence of God, because it is a gift of love for you. Number three, Jesus' sacrifice is better because it is necessary for you. And it's necessary for me. Rome, Paul in, the, in Romans 3.23 again says, for all have sinned, for all have sinned. Hebrews 9.9 9 says this. As soon as I find it here, here we go. He says this, he says, according to this arrangement, he's talking about the arrangement the Hebrews had, gifts and sacrifices are offered, and I thought this is interesting, that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. In other words, we needed Jesus. We needed Jesus. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, he says, none is righteous, no, not one. We all need, we all need Jesus to die for us. Jesus' sacrifice is necessary for you, and it's necessary for me. But what is also true, number four, is Jesus' sacrifice, and hear this, Jesus' sacrifice is enough for you. You see, the Apostle Paul was a murderer and a Christian hater. You see, the Apostle Peter was you with profanity over and over again denied that he even knew Jesus. You see, King David 
who is told in the scriptures that he had, he was a man after God's own heart. He was an adulterer and a murderer. Jesus' sacrifice, if it is enough for them, it is enough for you. It is enough for me. And look at what the writer of Hebrews says in that section we were looking at in verse 14 of chapter 9. He talks about everything about the, that had, had done through the sacrifices of the Hebrew people. And then he's talking about Jesus, and he says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Romans 8, 1 again, huh? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're struggling with, Jesus is for you. He died for you. And his sacrifice is enough for you. And number five, and lastly, Jesus' sacrifice is better because it is final for you. No other sacrifices. If you look at chapter 9, verse 12, what does it say? It says, he entered how many times? Once for all into the holy place. And what does he secure? He secures eternal, eternal redemption. Again, in Hebrews, in chapter 10, verse 10, he says this. He says, and by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once for all. And then in verse 14 of chapter 10, he says this as well. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time. Get that? He perfected you for all time. Those who are being sanctified, those who have accepted Jesus, those who have bowed the knee to him. For by a single offering, he perfected you for all time. You see a life had to be given for atonement of sin. And the people before Jesus had to do that every year. And the tent and the ceremony and the high priest were all just a picture, a copy, a ceremony that pointed to the very work of Christ as our high priest and our sacrifice. When, when Christ came as our high priest, a better sacrifice, a real and eternal sacrifice was offered by Christ himself. He had no need to offer a sacrifice for himself, for he himself was the God-man, perfect in every way. He did not offer his sacrifice in a humanly constructed tent, but in the very heavenly tabernacle of God. He said, Father, here I am. It is finished. It is done. I have sacrificed myself for the people. And because he rose from the dead, his sacrifice is eternal. He entered once for all by means of his own blood, securing eternal redemption. See, the book of Hebrews deals extensively. Um, commentator that I was reading, sorry, forgot to tell you that it was from a, a man named Guthrie, and he writes this. He says, the book of Hebrews deals extensively with how decisively the Son of God has dealt with our sin. Get that? How decisively. His one sacrifice has provided complete forgiveness for all sins for all time. Since we continue, he goes on to say, 
to deal with sin, alas, it still has, it still has power against we must, str- we, we must start struggle, which, which we struggle. We all know that, right? It's easy to forget the decisiveness with which our sin has been addressed. Any of you do this? Any of you just decide to do something you know God wouldn't want you to do? You do it anyway, right? And you go, I got to give myself a time out from God. I got to go over in the corner for a while. Maybe, you know, I better just set my Bible down for a few days, just let it rest, give God a chance to cool off, you know. What am I doing? I'm trying to earn again, and I've forgotten. I've forgotten what it says, that his sacrifice is decisive. It has taken care of it once for all. God knows. Just go to him and say, and God will say, I know, I know, I still love you. I took care of that on the cross. Guthrie goes on to say, it is easy to forget the decisiveness with which our sin has been addressed. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews proclaims that the new covenant believer no longer has a consciousness of sin. In other words, meaning and awareness of sin prohibitive of our relationship with God. We already know there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when we sin, we can go with confidence into the very presence of God. And he says, and Guthrie says, rather we have free entrance into the most holy place by virtue of what? Of our high priest, Jesus. And he goes on to say, this is a cause for great celebration. Our sins, past and present, have already been paid for by one sacrifice, a sacrifice so effective that it never, it never needs to be repeated. Is Jesus better? Is Jesus better than the angels? Does Jesus offer a better rest? Is Jesus a better priest? Is Jesus a better sacrifice? Perfect. God, man, once for all, died for you and me willingly to allow us into his family and into the very presence of his Father. I want to go back to John chapter 3, verse 16, but I want to add on verse 17 as we close. It says this, the, uh, right, the gospel of John, the apostle John wrote this, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, there's the, there's the key, isn't it? That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You got that? Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn you. He came, go on, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He willingly sacrificed for you out of love for you once for all for all eternity, all you have to do is believe. Is Jesus better? You bet he is. Let's pray. God, thank you, thank you, thank you for the reminder this morning of all that you have done for us. Thank you for the magnitude of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. God, I pray that you will help us to go out into this week and be reminded every day that Jesus is better and that we would bow the knee to him and let him lead and let him live through us. That in the midst of all the confusion of life and everything going on, remind us, that Jesus is better. 
and that we may go out and live lives that reflect that truth in a world that so desperately needs it. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.